right, hi. Let's go to the first chart. This is pure math. I'm sure you saw this morning, in the last couple of weeks, bad announcements from a lot of companies, but I'm, I'm trying to give you a lot of historical context, complicated chart. Uh, chart starts in the year 2008. Can everybody see that? 2008. And then extends to 2015. So long time, really sort of post-crash of the stock market going out to 2015. And what does this chart say? It says that the S&P 500, let me be clear, it's Standard & Poor's 500, 500 biggest companies, and it's really a domestic sort of U.S. view. And what does it say? No growth. Revenue growth less than 1%. So if your belief is that the stock market rise is driven by growth, you would be wrong. Earnings are up 5%, roughly speaking, 5 to 6 over the same time frame. So one minus six is negative five. And that generally, not perfectly, but generally means expenses are down during that same time frame. So what's the takeaway from this chart? Stock market rise, big, um, not based on revenue growth, based on earnings growth, and almost all the earnings growth is based on expenses being cut. Okay? And the market is given a big reward for those expense cuts. Okay? That's first fact. Next subject. Next chart. This is what's happened to our IT market. By the way, remember that first chart. I just gave you a standard of poorest 500. Simultaneously, you've heard of these things, the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China. Okay? Whole different thing. Brazil. Blowing and going, 5 6% growth in that same 2008 time frame. GDP growth. What is it now? Negative four. Negative four. Three trillion dollar economy. Russia, I won't even go into it. A lot of problems. 50% of the economy is based on what commodity? Oil, right? Oil halves, what happens to their economy? Down 25%. Okay, my conclusion, that's bad. China, blow and go days, 9, 10% growth. What is it now? Nobody knows. You want me to, I'm gonna get, you want me to guess, Judy? Yes, yeah, she wants me to, she doesn't really want me to guess, but I asked her to say, she wants me to guess. I guess it's two. Three, no better. All of that is coming out of the economy, and then this is what's happening to IT. Now, I changed the chart on you a little bit. I started out in 2008, this chart starts in 2011, goes to 2015, no longer S&P 500. Now I'm looking at global IT. This says we're down maybe this year as much as 5%. When the guys that predict the past, which is sort of what the, the research guys do, they will predict that the past declined 5%. Uh, my guess, it could be four. But this will be the first year that we've seen the big, big part of IT, businesses, decline 5%. That's the backdrop of what we're operating in. Next, uh, next chart. So I thought I'd give you a quick thing about CEOs. One of my favorite positions uh, in the market, I'm very empathetic to the plight of, uh, of CEOs, and they don't last long. So when I started, you know, you know a gajillion years ago, uh, CEOs lasted six years, now four and a half. Time frame going down shorter. I don't know if you noticed this morning, the news of all this Apple, um, you know, uh, sort of shock and awe with their, with their results was the announcement of three companies really basically being taken over by their boards being taken over by activists. Marvel, Yahoo, et cetera, and basically CEOs I'd almost say to some degree, under siege. You have activists come in and say, I've got big ideas for you. Let me give you the big ideas. Let's cut expenses. Let's take the money and buy back stock. We have other big ideas. Why don't you grow faster? And no, no, these are big, these are big ideas. And you know, I, I, I always hear these and I'm like, God, I wish I'd have thought of this stuff. I, 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 <laughs> I hadn't, now that you guys are here, and by the way, we don't have them. Uh, we have one 
we have the benefit of one founder who uh, owns a, a lot of our company. This is a blessing compared to what I told you just a few minutes ago, right? So this is a very tough environment. I just try to make sure you understand the context. CEOs last four and a half years. Four and a half years measured in quarters is 18 quarters. Doesn't sound too long, does it? So I got 18 quarters to make this thing go. So remember when you show up to a CEO and say, hey, how you doing? I have a huge idea. Let's do some big transformation. What do you think's going through the CEO's head? I don't know. I don't know. You can think they're thinking noble ideas, big strategic ideas, but most of the time, they're thinking about getting through the quarter. They're thinking about getting through the next six months. They're thinking about getting through the year. They're thinking of getting through four and a half years, 18 quarters. And I have to drive cash flow. I have to drive earnings per share. I have to drive stock up. Or else these guys show up that I just talked about with big ideas. And they run your life. That's the backdrop of sort of what we're dealing with. Next chart. Uh, I thought I'd switch sort of, uh, you probably, I'm sure, well, I'm not sure. Everybody may have heard of the American Customer Satisfaction Index. By the way, they just did a nice thing on airlines yesterday that I thought was very interesting, but it's really trying to intersect. They own a bunch of stocks. And a very simple thesis. Those companies that have happy customers produce better stock returns than companies with unhappy customers. Again, big ideas. Grow revenue, cut expenses, have happier customers. This says, if you have happier customers, you get about five times, maybe a little more, the return than if you have unhappy customers. So this is measured in the stock results of their portfolio. Not a big shazam, but sort of interesting when you see it monetized in actual numbers. 5X. You know, we have a market cap, I don't know, probably this morning, $170 billion. I'd like to get, let's see, 5X 170. 850. Now that would imply we're on the bottom part, but you can imagine the implication of happier customers, 5X, and this is a 5X market cap sort of play. So big, big numbers. So now you're back, remember back, you're sitting in the CEO's chair? Is this worth chasing? Then how much money do I want to invest relative to the fact that I have a short-term crunch and yet a long-term objective at the same time to grow my market cap. Let me, let's keep going. Next chart. Let me give you one uh, other point. This is a confession. I'm making this confession because um, I wrote a blog a couple years ago, and I bought into this uh, millennial myth. Uh, all these millennials are different. They're so different. This is a different thing. And I thought, yeah, this is right. And the data sort of uh, supported it. I read a bunch of surveys. I saw a survey from, well, I won't go into names because it'll look like I'm, 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 doing, I'm saying negative things about people, but I read a lot of surveys. Simultaneously, we're hiring a lot of people. So I, I bet this number will surprise you. We have 140,000 people at our company. 38% are millennials. A lot of people. So imagine we have in the neighborhood of 60,000 millennials in the company. And guess what we do? We have 10,000, just 10,000 U.S. college kids we've hired in the last uh, five odd years. So I now think I have better data than anybody. I have better data than, well, I won't, again, I won't use names. Insert research company's name here. I think I have better data. And when I do the surveys, and I ask the same questions repeatedly, I think the value of the millennial, the values, core values, and the core values of the baby boomer and the Gen X in between, no different. I think it's no different. You ask them about career path. By the way, and the surveys I find are also sort of scaled. It's like asking a baby boomer. I see Joanne here, Mark. We're, we're both baby boomers. Okay, is that okay for me to say that? That's okay, thank you very much. Uh, as I got the okay. Uh, yeah, it's her confession for the day. Baby Bober, she hates, she's not as old as me. I'll put you that. Uh, but not. Uh, not. 
Uh, but anyway, uh, but, but back, to the, back to my point, I digress. Um, what is the real generational difference? I mean, if you ask me about career pathing, I have two choices in my career right now, retire or stay. So if you ask me how important is career pathing, you know, it's not that important to me. Now, if you ask a millennial, you get a different answer. But if you'd asked me 35 years ago, you'd got a very different answer. It was real important to me. So when you ask the question a different way, you get a different set of answers. Now, let me tell you what the real difference is. There is a generational difference in the use of technology. The difference in the ability for now, you know, this, this age bracket, what comes up very differently is, I'm very clear on how to demand better customer service. I expect better customer service. I expect either a better employee experience, but a lot of that is based on how they were, how they were sort of birthed and grown up and evolved through their experiences. So technology has definitely changed, but I just want to make sure I'm clear. I don't think the core values are any different. I don't think the values of, of uh, flexibility, of money, of career pathing, of leadership, of winning, of being part of a, a team, that I don't think any of those core values are at any difference at all. In fact, when you look at the survey data, 60,000 strong over now multiple years tells me nothing. The big difference is my use of technology. This generation, professional complainers. I've learned, why? I know how to do it. I didn't. I mean, if I had, uh, I'm going to sit just for a second, get, just to make sure I get this point across. I didn't grow up knowing how to complain. I didn't know how to do it. I, the way I did it was I called somebody directly and I yelled at them. What was my ability to get leverage? Minimal. I might get a coupon, I might get a, you know, a, a something sent to me, but that's about it. My, basically, my complaining was one-to-one. -one. I didn't have TripAdvisor, I didn't have Yelp, I didn't have any of these platforms that I could go one-to-many the way this generation can. Huge change now in the market in terms of the ability of this generation to communicate and be able to collaborate. By the way, I could go down the whole difference in the employee side. Our employees expect more of us as companies in terms of platforms and collaboration tools than they ever did before. And those employees are somebody else's customers. So there's a fundamental generational change in the adaptation and the utilization of technology at the same time as all of these other macroeconomic issues that I'm describing above. Next chart. And this impact will be in B2C really quickly. And I only draw this chart because B2B business to business, the buyers are still who? Baby boomers. They're, the, they're dominating the CXO suite and will for a little bit of time. I hope. I'm kidding, Heather. But Gen X will take over and you know, this, you'll see the natural order occur. Not in B2C. 20% of the US economy right now is millennials. That doesn't move linearly. It actually moves geometrically. 50% of the U.S. economy in just four more years will be millennials. So the impact in B to C will be immediate. I could make an argument the impact of B to B to C, meaning our selling to our customers who then deal with consumers, is the next impact. B to C, B to B to C, B to B. That's how you'll see this impact over the next 10 to 15 years, and the B to C impact is as we speak. It's an immediate disruption to the market. Next chart. Um, these are, I always love these uh, thoughts. I just, they're simple, but I, I just want to make sure clear. The objectives for the customer experience, if you want to grow revenue, you got to have happier customers. I only know a few ways to grow revenue. Now, let me go back to a point I want to make. Most of what's got to occur, remember that 1% growth number? The easiest time to grow is when? Now listen, I'm here at, mostly people here are involved in marketing or sales. When's the easiest time to grow? Boy, we're in trouble here. Easiest time to grow is when the market's growing. I can draft behind a market growth. What's much harder? Stealing somebody else's customers. Steal sounds bad, doesn't it? I, I, I share shift, that sounds better. Share shift, is that okay? Share shift, yeah. So share shift, that's better. 
but that's what you got to do. 1% revenue growth. There's no layups. So what do you got to do to, to steal share? You got to build a better product. You can lower your prices. By the way, that doesn't help. Remember the CEO earlier? Lowering prices doesn't help me too much. Or I can deliver better customer service. If somebody's got another great idea, I'd love to hear it. But these are the three ways to get it through. What happens with a product cycle? What takes the longest of the three? Building new products. Go tell the engineer, hey, I got a big idea. Why don't you just build me a great new idea, a big new product? Okay, I'll get working on that. Remember, I got 18 quarters, I'm the CEO. If I start day one and I got a two-year product cycle, I may not make it. 18 quarters is the average. Some go sooner to make an 18-quarter average. Quickest thing I can do, I could lower prices. The problem is it has another effect. Lowers my margins. Best thing I can do, get happier customers deliver better service. I can change that fast, and it has a huge return based on my chart, four or five charts back, okay? So that's sort of the concept. You gotta grow, you gotta grow revenue, I gotta take share. Next chart. Two of my favorite industries. Banking. I don't know how many people here work at a bank, and I mean this in a most favorable way. I, I, I love banking, uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting market. A group of Big banks that make a lot of money, historically not threatened. When they get threatened, what do they do? They typically buy each other. It's a great market. You get some share, you have success, I'll just buy you. Because we really don't want to compete. Four big banks now have to compete. 70 million customers, the four big banks have 70 million customers on average. I just want you to think about that. 70 million customers. Let's say I'm the CEO of one of the four banks and I want to double the revenue. You want to have that job? So we got a couple choices. We could go find 70 million more customers. Does that sound easy? Guess what? Most of these banks make 40 products. Some actually make as high as 60, 70 products. They don't make them. These are basically financial instruments and financial services that you can obtain. The average customer uses about three. So what does that mean? Most banks have the same customer. They share a customer with other banks. So you're talking to the same customer that another bank is. Now, do we think it's easier that if you have three of my products, I can sell you three more? Or that I can find 70 million more customers? By the way, it's rhetorical. I'm not, I'm not really trying to show this up as a difficult question that I want you to cogitate on too long. Much easier to cross-sell and upsell to the same customer. Now, I use this example of my bank, which happens to be one of the four. I've been a customer there for 35 years. Long time. Long time. You would think they might know me by now. Now, Give you a true story. I have, I, I don't want to get into too much detail, but I was telling the story earlier this morning. Every now and then, I have a lot of money that flows through my checking account. And it flows through there for just a period of time. It goes into it and then comes out. And I get like clockwork, a phone call. Mr. Hurd, how are you? I'm like, who are you? I'm with XYZ Bank and I just have a few questions for you. And I won't take you through all the questions, but the fundamental thesis of the call is, are you doing something illegal? Are you, you know, no, are you a drug dealer? Are you, you know, and, and they're, they're, with a veil, they're veiled in a way that they don't really accuse you of a felony, but they sort of get through, I don't, we'd like to know for you explain to us why this money has come into your account. And I start with, usually it's none of your damn business, right? And, and I don't plan to explain anything to you. Now, what they do effectively, I hope you can tell, is they effectively piss me off. <laughs> they do. I get through with a phone call. I tell my wife about it. I, I'll tell anybody who's within, as long as it's in my memory for an hour or so, I'll tell anybody I talk to. I'm frustrated. Never do, do they say, hey, have you thought about using a credit card? Never do they say, how would you like us to have a private bank or a card? Nothing. It's a silo of the bank doing its job doing what some regulator told them to do. 
They can fill out a form. They can send the form in and say, we did it. He's not a drug dealer. It's objective. This is a horrific process. By the way, the C, well, I don't want to say who this bank is. It'll feel, figure it out if I tell you too much. So I don't want to say it. But by the way, it's not unique to them. It's again these silo, the credit card group doesn't talk. You, you know how this works. Silo processes, you have a moment of truth, you're talking to a customer, and you choose to spend it on vetting whether I'm a drug dealer. Huge mistake. Phone service. One of my other favorite, um, by the way, probably one everybody can relate to. I mean, doesn't everybody, everybody now has a device like this. You may not have this one, you may have another one. But how often do you ever get any thoughtful messages from your carrier? You know, hi. How you doing? How's France? They know exactly, my carrier knows exactly where I am every day of the week. They know what I'm doing. They know the strength of my signal. They know how many people I have on a conference call. They know, by the way, do you know how I know that? We sell them the software <laughs> that, that, that tells them all of that. So I know what they know. So I know they know everything about what I'm doing. They, know I'm, they actually know right now I'm in Vegas. They know I'm in this room. They know the strength of my signal. They know whether I've got a good call. They know I'm on a conference call. Do they ever say, hey, Mark, how you doing? Would you like a stronger signal? We'll dial it up. You can buy it for a couple of extra cents. Now, the only thing they do, like clockwork regularly, is send me a bill. Send me a bill. No communication to optimize. By the way, worse yet, if I get upset, and they drop me, you know, there's roughly about 30% churn. By the way, in this country, four big cellular providers, no different from, from what goes on in banks. Four big ones. About 30% churn of those buyers. 30% per year. By the way, you know when you call, when, you're, when I'm upset, you know, I'm, I told you how I complain. I don't get on, you know, these diff different forums. I just call. When I call, the calls usually where somebody cancels service last, how long, does anybody know? Less than three minutes. I call, hey, you dropped me, I'm upset. Three minutes, and who am I talking to? I'm talking to somebody in a call center who themselves churn at about 40 to 50% per year. So I'm talking to somebody who's not that experienced, really has no context who I am, maybe cares, maybe doesn't, and they have to get all the information about me to make a number of decisions really fast before I leave. And I've been there for years. So I only tell you about these two processes because they're fundamentally siloed processes. The network side, which knows the data, doesn't integrate to the customer side, that then deals with how you actually make me happier and deliver me service. By the way, is this because banks are stupid? No. Is this because service providers are stupid? No. It's mainly because processes are siloed. The automation of those processes is siloed. And it's very difficult to move cross process and then to be able to have a suite of capabilities, sort of like that video, which I sort of liked before, integrate together to give you a holistic view of what's actually happening in near real time. And this is a real problem. And by the way, this is against the backdrop of, hey, I'd love to do all this stuff, but remember revenue? It's not growing. Activists are at your doorstep. You gotta find the money to make these investments at the same time as we deliver today or else the consequences of what I told you 20 minutes ago. Next chart. By the way, I didn't mean all this to depress you. This was not my objective. So I think this is a real opportunity because what happens in each of these segments is the first to innovate, the first to change the answer wins. You know how this works with ShareShift? It doesn't work linearly. Everybody doesn't change at the same rate. Whoever changes first gets all the spoils. Whoever changes last is probably out of business. By the way, does everybody know this stat? A pop, this is a pop quiz. 1990, Fortune 500. How many people here work for a big company? You gotta, this is participation. You're not allowed to not answer. 
So how many people work for a Fortune 500 company? Okay, a lot of people. All right. Everybody know in 1990, what percent of the Fortune 500 is still in business? 1990. Let me give you the answer. 30%. 70% gone. Year 2000. 50-50. So if you think any of these big brands are impervious to change, you're wrong. And these markets shift based on who takes the market the fastest. All right. Uh, I think this, the reason why I, I pitched this whole sweets message, and by the way, we've got a lot of work to do. Let me be clear. We've got tremendous pieces in our portfolio. Our marketing cloud has become just superb in terms of its offering. Our sales suite, our e-commerce suite, our service suite, et cetera. And we've got work to do to continue to integrate these. And however good you think it is today, I promise you, with our 5.2 billion of R&D this morning, I checked our checking account. We've got about 53 billion in it. I mean, we'll continue. It's just good, right? I mean, it's good. And, and they haven't called me yet to ask if the company's a drug dealer, which is probably the next call I get. So, so at the same time, we have, we have tremendous assets, so we're going to do nothing but make our portfolio better. And it really is about us being able to give you the tools to integrate across process so you know your customer yet better. And that's why you're going to hear us push strategically on this whole sweets message, this ability to integrate data, this ability to integrate knowledge, and then most importantly, to get that knowledge in the hands of people that can make a difference at that moment of truth. That time when you're on the phone with me calling me a drug dealer. It's a moment of truth. I'm pissed. Now, the only good news is I'm really not, I'm sort of not going to switch. I've gotten used to this crummy service, and I take it. Someday I'll, get, I'll hit the breaking point, as all of us do, when we see a better opportunity. And so our job is to help integrate these processes, integrate this into a sort of seamless suite where you can move information and data back and forth and get access, whether you're in B2B, B2B to C, or B2B, to, or B to B, where you can get a holistic view as soon as you possibly can at that moment of truth to change the customer's perception of your business, which I believe in the end will change your market cap faster than any other alternative that I showed you earlier in my presentation. Next chart. Okay, this is my only chart where I'm talking about Oracle's uh, products. You didn't think I could get away without having one. So this is why this thing called the cloud is a big deal. Have you heard about this thing called the cloud thing? So it's, it's one of these overhyped uh, terms, very charismatic word. Um, Silicon Valley, 22 miles long, six miles wide, littered with piece part companies. What I mean by that server company, storage company, virtualization company, operating system company. And frankly, what's gone on historically is customers have integrated this together on their dime, their nickel. Very complex process. By the way, think about it this way. Every time you buy a server with an operating system, then buy a second server in a procurement strategy, you've made life more difficult. Every time you then buy two operating systems with two servers, you've multiplied that to four. Go then take in two databases, you have to then multiply, the complexities become an eight. Put two sets of middleware, you now have 16 permutations. This gets exponentially more complicated as you build these infrastructures out. And of that IT spend, 85% of that IT spend is on maintenance, just keeping the trains running. If you wonder why you can't go to IT and get more money, it's because I got a reason for you. There is no money. 85%, remember the poor, the poor CEO, I say poor because I'm empathetic, but the poor CEO who sits in the table who's trying, you know, you're not buying this empathy? Okay, I'm getting a lot of shakes in the front of the room, this isn't working, but let me try, let me try one more time. 18 quarters, a lot of activist pressure, not a lot of free market growth, and yet I have to transform. And the IT, the CIO says, hey, remember these old products? The average application in this country, 22 years old. 22 years old. So I'm not gonna ask anybody here to do the math, but 22 from 2016 is 1994. Apps built pre-search, pre-mobile, pre-historic, you know, pre all, all pre-everything. Pre-social, it means it's pre-mobile. So you got old applications that cost a lot to maintain. And the reason this cloud is so exciting is forget all the terms for a second, is I get a chance 
to switch that budget from your IT budget to somebody else's R&D budget. It's a huge sea change in not just the capability of the app, but the business strategy and the business model. And that's why this is such a big deal. This is an, let me make sure I'm clear with you and say it a different way. This is an economic reality. This doesn't just have to do with apps. This doesn't have to do that you like the marketing app better than your current marketing app. This has to do also with the business model. You're transforming the work or transferring the work from your IT budget to our R&D budget. That innovation, by the way, let me just give you an example. In our uh, sales fusion uh, organization, we have almost a couple thousand people working in our collective CX suite, 2,000 programmers. They become your IT staff. Ask yourself how many programmers you have actually now trying to transform your current legacy applications and then do the com comparison. There's no chance to be competitive in the old model with the current model. By the way, there's another interesting point about this. It actually costs less. It costs less than it does in the current on-premise model. So you have a model here that costs less and actually delivers to you more innovation than the previous model, and you can get that done at the same time. And that's why when you hear this stuff, and I, I try to cut through the rhetoric, when you hear this stuff about how exciting this cloud is, that's what's driving it. It isn't just about new applications. It's about the actual exchange of the business model. I'm gonna transfer the work, put it on somebody else, get higher innovation, I'm gonna do it with a less complicated environment, get rid of all this complexity I built on premise and transfer it out. And at the same time, I get more modern capabilities as I go. Now, the trick is, I do not think, as I said earlier, you're gonna see companies go out and buy from 100 different cloud providers. And what you have to be cautious about is particularly those of you that are in this thing called CX, this customer experience. The, the challenge for you is there's a plethora of providers. Plethora, can I say that? Plethora, yeah, a lot. So there's a lot of providers, a lot of just marketing providers, lots of less sales automation providers, several service automation providers. So it's very easy to go down the path of more silos. You can just have the same complexity in the cloud that you had on premise. You'll get some benefits, cost a little bit less, you'll get more innovation. The true benefit will be if I can get a suite in the cloud, get all of that data, all of that information integrated, be able to integrate that at the time I need it, at that moment of truth, that I can boost my customer satisfaction levels to the, describe, the description I made earlier that can be game changing. And the reason I gave you those industry examples was to tell you as rudimentary, and they sound so rudimentary, I think they do, but it's what's out there. You all live it every day as consumers. I mean, you all feel, that, you gotta feel the same thing I do. I mean, how many people really sit today saying, I have such a fantastic customer experience when I deal with my bank or I deal with my, I mean, you know, this is all nonsense, right? It's just, it's today still very, very challenging, which for you is not a problem. It's an opportunity. This is, we're living through what's gonna be one of the biggest opportunities that at least certainly that I can see coming up. It's gonna take 10 years, my guess, maybe a little less, to see this full rotation. Just to give you an idea, if you take the four biggest clouds in the world, four biggest, they add up to 25 billion in revenue. Four biggest, of which we're one of the four. Add them up. I won't go through the other three because I don't want to give them any brand recognition. Um, but you add all four, you get 25 billion. That's 25 billion of 950 billion. Meaning what? 925 billion is still in the old model? If you think you've seen a lot so far, you've seen nothing. Wait till 25 billion becomes 50 billion, 70 billion, 100 billion. This world that we've come to know in IT will never be the same, ever. You see these results over the past couple of weeks with companies struggling, all traditional on-premise models? You've seen nothing. This whole thing is about to shift before our very eyes. And it's headed to a new business model. This is an irresistible force. Our job is to execute this strategy. Our strategy is in the application layer, which is all I'm gonna talk about today, but I'm gonna mention a couple of other things, but I'm only gonna talk about the application layer. 
is to provide best of breed applications in each single discipline. The best sales automation solution, the best marketing automation solution, the best service automation solution. But at the same time to provide a suite of capability. We have to do both. We can't deliver individual crummy applications, but say, I know they're all crummy individually, but because they're a suite, they're fine. Won't work. They've individually got to be best of breed and they have to work together. We're the leader in most of the segments we compete today and the only company with a full suite. And it's our job to keep advancing this strategy as fast as we can, which is why we spend as much R&D as we do why we acquire what we do. We have a build and buy strategy. We use that $50 billion plus of cash to buy assets that our R&D isn't working on building. And our commitment is to continue to advance this stack faster than anybody in the industry to accomplish that outcome for our customers, which is what I described uh, earlier. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there. I, I see by the clock I'm supposed to be done. So um, I, guess I'd, I guess I'd end by saying it's, uh, I'm so thankful you all decided to come spend time with us. Uh, if there's anything uh, that we can do during the conference, please let our team know. And again, thanks for spending your time with Oracle. We really appreciate it. Okay, have a good day. Bye.